I'm Don Tapscott. And I'm Alex Tapscott. And this is What's on Tap. Alex, uh, another big week. They just continue. Uh, Bitcoin is <clears throat> growing back, it seems, up and down. A lot going on. Actually, why don't we start with a piece that you wrote, uh, an op-ed piece in the Financial Post, where you argued that um, that blockchain technology is leading to DeFi, and this will revolutionize the financial industry. But you actually picked apart the different elements of the industry that can be eliminated by software. Uh, first of all, what's the thesis? And if I'm a banker, should I really be concerned that some software can take away many of the core uh, functions that I perform in the market? Or um, is this just a kind of a hyperbole? What do you say? Well, there's definitely lots of excitement around DeFi today, but I think the excitement is justified. Um, and the reason is that DeFi is enabling all sorts of new models for doing what the financial industry does today, but um, online in a purely digital format. So we all know about Bitcoin. Bitcoin demonstrated that we can create a system where you can move value peer to peer without an intermediary. DeFi just builds on that concept um, through the introduction of this uh, thing called a smart contract. Uh, smart contracts were pioneered on the Ethereum network. And today, um, despite there being lots of innovation in other areas of blockchain, Ethereum is really where most of the DeFi applications are being built. Um, a smart contract basically is code that self-executes on a blockchain. So it can represent everything from an exchange to an insurance contract uh, to uh, a lending protocol. So a way to you know connect borrowers and lenders um, and much, much more, um, essentially enabling peer-to-peer -peer models for doing everything the industry does today. And it turns out the financial industry basically performs nine essential functions in our economy. And they're essential because the industry is, you know, more than any single industry, it's really uh, foundational to all economic activity. And those nine things are everything from moving money to storing money, to lending money, to creating ways to exchange financial assets, to insure against risk, to do accounting and, and so forth. And um, there are DeFi projects today that are tackling every single one of those things. And this isn't proof of concept pilot type stuff. We're talking about um, projects that are in many ways outpacing their bigger, more established FinTech rivals. So for example, DAI, which is a decentralized stable coin, a way to move money that's pegged to the dollar, does more vo volume than Venmo, something I'm sure most people know about. Um, m most people know Venmo, but don't know that DAI is bigger than Venmo. Um, Uniswap, a decentralized exchange, just a bunch of smart contracts connecting uh, buyers and sellers of financial assets, um, often in, has days where it's larger than Coinbase, which is a $50 billion New York stock exchange listed company. So if I were, you know, more had, had a firm like CIBC or Bank of Montreal or something, um, you know, those are companies whose market caps are smaller than the, than that of Coinbase. And now you've got a decentralized exchange outstripping Coinbase in terms of dollar value of trade. So I would be paying attention. I think these are technologies that are growing really rapidly. And it's always, you know, not so much much a function of, of the, the number, but of the rate of change in the number, right? So the value today of DeFi projects is maybe $100 billion, which is pretty significant, but small relative to the size of all, uh, you know, banks put together potentially. Um, but it was a billion dollars a year ago. So that's the kind of growth rate that you can extrapolate some pretty big changes from. So yes, I think it's really exciting. And I think people should be paying attention. Now, if I'm a banker, I say, well, I'm doing open finance, and that's uh, pretty much the same thing, right? So we're all over this. Uh, just chill. What's yeah. Your <laughs> well, I think that comment would betray a basic understanding of what's going on. Um, you know, open finance is the idea that um, financial information about customers should be made more readily available to startups in the fintech space so that they can target customers more effectively. That's not DeFi. That's something very different. Um, and I think that, you know, fintech in general, while there's lots of really useful and interesting fintech companies, is more really just digital wallpaper, right? Um, it's not getting to the root of the industry and how it works. It is a fresh coat of paint on an old house that's got old infrastructure. You know, the infrastructure of the banking system 
um, in many respects is is older than I am. Um, you know, the payment infrastructure of SWIFT, for example, or ACH, the system that the Fed uses to settle wire transfers, were developed in the 1970s, right? Um, when people were using, you know, mainframes and floppy disks and so forth. So, you know, fintech is definitely an improvement. Don't get me wrong. But DeFi is a, a new architecture. It is a reimagining of every single thing that the financial industry does today. And that's what makes it so exciting. I will point out that these ideas are discussed in your new book called Financial Services Revolution, uh, available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Um, <laughs> So, um, and check out the article, everybody, Alex Tapscott, why DeFi and smart contracts are the future of finance. If Bitcoin was the spark for financial services, uh, for the financial services revolution, then DeFi is the accelerant. <laughs> All right, prairie fire here. Although analogies like that are kind of mm, touchy these days. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's move on to Bitcoin. Um, it bounced back. Anything significant happening here? Is this just the usual uh, wild ride? Well, we try not to spend too much time on this podcast talking about, you know, the daily gyrations of specific crypto assets, but Bitcoin obviously is a big asset. And so people do care. You know, there's a bunch of things that I think folks are pointing to. Um, a lot of traders use technicals. So that's looking at a chart basically to determine sort of where things are at. Uh, Bitcoin has tested the $30,000 levels uh, level four times and has bounced every single time. So that's acted as a key level. And it's also uh, broken through a couple of other key indicators, the moving average on the 50 day basis, and um, soon potentially the 200 day basis is another one that people are looking for. So again, not who knows, but the traders are looking at that stuff. Um, some interesting news though, we've seen some, uh, there was a study by Goldman Sachs saying that 15% of family offices today hold crypto, but that 45% more plan on buying it in the near future, um, which obviously will act as a tremendous tailwind. Family offices collectively control trillions of dollars of buying power and uh, could act as a real tailwind for the industry. Um, another thing that we, we look at are fund flows in and out of um, you know listed crypto asset uh, products. So these are ETFs and things like that. Um, there were outflows for, for most of the past couple of months um, of around a half a billion dollars, and that's uh, now leveled off and is basically flat. So that's no longer a source of selling pressure. And we're seeing, you know, I think the rebound from the problems caused by China banning mining. Um, you know, we said at the time, short-term pain for long-term gain. Right. And it would appear that that's, that's what's happening. Um, so at the time, a lot of miners had to go offline and that caused the uh, hash rate to decline significantly. So the difficulty level of mining declined and you know that usually correlates with price. And now we're starting to see that rebound as these miners get set up in other areas. And it's worth pointing out too, that some of the areas that they're getting set up in are places like the US and Canada uh, and elsewhere. Um, so overall for the, I think health of, of the Bitcoin network, it's probably better that mining is more uh, spread out and that it's in places like the US and Canada, not in China. So who knows? I mean, these are all things that people are pointing to, but obviously um, it's got people paying attention to Bitcoin again. Our view, of course, is that, you know, don't let the, the tail wag the dog or don't get focused on, on price alone. What really matters is the kind of innovation that's happening under the surface. And actually, I think that's a good segue to talk about some recent research that you've put out at the BRI. Um, one in particular, uh, looking at two very specific protocols, which I think maybe most, I don't know, mainstream listeners who are not in the crypto space don't know about, but for those who are in this um, world of public blockchains, these would be considered two of the premier and most exciting projects, Cosmos and Polkadot. Um, why don't we talk about those two things? What are those projects, what are those protocols um, seeking to achieve and why is that important? Well, it's a really interesting paper, and I just recorded the video for it. Uh, it's available for uh, two members of the Blockchain Research Institute for now, uh, but we will be releasing it uh, in, in due time. But the, the big issues here are, uh, I guess, threefold. One is portability. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, yep, Sunny, remember when? Um, 
we had a world of mainframes and mini computers and each had their own operating platform or their own protocols and applications would only run on that platform. So you couldn't move an application from that platform to another one uh, because that was called doing a conversion, a term that uh, caused great fear and consternation for any uh, CIO. And uh, back then I used to say, it's like the hotel proprietary. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> so you were stuck, basically, um, with your app running on that platform. Um, and the same problem exists today, is we have a proliferation of all of these different blockchain platforms that we can build apps on them, but, but the apps are not portable. The second big concern is about scalability and throughput. Um, this is an obvious and longstanding problem. We talked about it five, six years ago in blockchain revolution that um, the way, one way to achieve scalability and throughput of, of these platforms is to have them interconnect. So you have multiple platforms being able to do stuff. And um, yeah. the, the third one really has to do with assets and the value of assets are sort of locked into a walled garden. You know, nobody, uh, that, that puts downward pressure on the value of assets. and. And nobody wants to store their assets on a blockchain that doesn't gain traction among developers. So assets can get locked up uh, in, into uh, one of these. So um, this, is, this is the problem, essentially, it's being uh, addressed. And uh, Cosmos and po Polkadot are attempting to solve this problem. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's an interesting <clears throat> um, and very difficult problem to solve. And... In the world of DeFi, this is something that people are acutely aware of and they're trying to figure out, you know, how to overcome because there are lots of use cases and applications where you want to, you know, take assets that are in an application on one blockchain and have them work in another one, right? You're lending money from one DeFi application on Ethereum and you want to use those funds to buy assets on a decentralized exchange on another network. Well, how are you going to do that? Um, and so the, having these, and you know, the now that sounds sort of foreign to people maybe, but there are plenty of analogies to the traditional world of tech and how things used to work. I mean, imagine you had to get like a hundred different internets in the nineties and, you know, to get, to go from one website to another, you know, required you to, to sign out of one internet and sign into another internet. I mean, these are kind of would have been severely curtailed the potential of the internet. So, you know, the, the internet has TCP IP. It has a common communicating language and protocol that allows yeah. these different networks to interconnect. And that's how I think of, of Cosmos and Polkadot is trying to, to achieve that. In fact, I think Cosmos is, um, tagline is the internet of blockchains because you know they view themselves as being that um, that mesh that webs and connects all of these different things together. And it's worth pointing out, by the way, again that this is not scientific, you know, pie in the sky. Like these things are operating today, and they're doing this. So they're not alone. There's another one called um, Polygon, which is um, considered what's called a layer two. So <clears throat> instead of being a whole separate blockchain like Cosmos and Polkadot. Um, they are built on top of Ethereum and is sort of like a gateway into the Ethereum network and out of the Ethereum network, what they call a bridge, essentially. Um, so this is obviously a, a, an interesting challenge and problem and one that, that um, smart people are working on. You know, and it's worth pointing out as well that the aggregate value of Cosmos, Polkadot, Polygon and others is in the tens of billions of dollars. <laughs> so um, they, must be, they must be doing something <clears throat> uh, right as well. Um, so yeah. why don't we talk about, so you've been also been doing some research into some big apps in the blockchain space, maybe beyond the world of, of, of DeFi and crypto, um, yeah. that are really starting to take hold. Um, why don't you talk about some of your findings there? Well, we're addressing this continual concern. I'd almost say it's a myth that, well, blockchain is very cool and there's a lot of pilots and a bunch of them fail, but nothing really fundamentally uh new is happening and there are no applications that are really transforming or changing an industry so we've published a, a lot of stuff about this to sort of debunk that myth now for sure it's taking a while uh, longer than the internet with the internet today you want to build build an app and 
go to market, you call up Shopify, and three days later, you're buying, you're selling stuff online. Whereas with blockchain, you're changing entire industries, supply chains, uh, you're changing the deep structure and architecture of the firm. And uh, this is going to take a while. But people confuse that, that the, that the change is very profound with the notion that, well, maybe change is just not happening. So this is kind of an interesting uh, paper. And I again, I just recorded the video for this. It was done in partnership with Pro uh, Project Management Institute. And um, this particular project looked at four applications that are really fundamentally changing industries. Um, the first, uh, and I'll just uh, mention what they are. The first is the registration of assets, uh, such as land or intellectual property. And they talk about real concrete situations. Block Scale Solutions has this distributed land registry that's working in Haryana, India. You remember that we wrote about this in, um, in Blockchain Revolution. And the big problem, you know, we said that 70% of, uh, of uh, property um, titles in, in the developing world are not enforceable. And uh, this seemed like a no-brainer application, but it's taken a while. And the reason is not the immaturity of the technology. The reason is that it, 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 you have to get a valid land title in the first place. You know, you have to be able to know that 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 the that, the, that if something's for sale, it's the correct plot of land, and that the seller is in fact the rightful owner. So once you have that established, then you get it onto a blockchain, and nobody can really mess with it. So this is now happening, and this is an application. At land titles, um, the the uh, the researchers on this project are quite convinced that this is a absolute systemic material change that's happening uh, in an industry. Um, the uh, second app is tracking of the uh, flow of commodities like uh, food, diamonds, cobalt. And uh, they look at projects in each of those areas. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the food, uh, uh, pro understanding the provenance of food going into Walmart, for example, it used to take them three months to find out what what went wrong with a bad avocado. Now they can do it in 20 seconds. And a big one that's highlighted is conflict diamonds that, uh, again, we talked about in the book, but this is now happening, um, that the whole diamond certification process has been paper-based. It's fraught with uh, uh, corruption, forgery, and conflict diamonds uh, have been sl slipping into the supply. And these things are the source of war and tribal conflicts and terrorism and have resulted probably in hundreds of thousands of people dying. So Everledger is really the um, the, the main blockchain company that's tackled this problem, uh, working with um, working with a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, network of NGOs and companies and governments and different partners. And there's an immutable record now of each diamond's defining traits, its origin, its uh, its ownership. And if you want to buy a diamond, you can track the province and verify the authenticity of every uh, diamond in the chain. Uh, the third one that they mention is contracted mint, which is actually happening. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is like, a, for example, in the whole construction uh, industry, uh, there's a company called IntelliWave that um, they have this application called SightSense, where they uh, combine uh, blockchain with the Internet of Things, Trivergence, right? Mobile apps to improve uh, construction project visibility. So everything that's happening is visible on a ledger. They capture all the essential documentation about a, uh, a project in a shared distributed ledger and all parties can access all the data in, in real time. You just scan the QR code on that Bean or whatever it is. And um, site manager can get access to the serial numbers, photos, provenance, uh, uh, whatever. And the fourth one, not to go on here, uh, but I tend to do that, is um, is a, a streamlining industry workflows. And um, really interesting stuff happening in the insurance market where a reinsurer compensates a, um, uh, a company for loss uh, exceeding a specific limit. It's called excessive loss reinsurance. And um, they talk about a company called B3I Services 
that's uh, basically uh, streamlining all these transactions and they create a shared um, a shared network state where everybody can participate. And the participants are Allianz, Swiss Re, Zurich Insurance Group, uh, and so on. And they actually measured the improvements uh, that were happening as a result of this, and they're quite spectacular. So uh, nothing's happening. Well, these are just four of the dozens, I guess hundreds, of, of examples that we're studying at the Blockchain Research Institute that would be lie that statement. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, and of course, and of course, um, everything that that's going on in the DeFi space and the NFT space as well that are just like yeah. it's just categorically refute that statement. I mean, there are applications built on public blockchains that have millions of users that secure billions of dollars of value and are, um, you know, as we've discussed, sort of shaking the windows and rattling the walls of of some of the bigger firms in, in those industries and. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, that criticism that belongs um, uh, in history, honestly. I don't really understand anybody who still makes that <laughs> critique well, I think, of blockchain. I hear it all. Um, um, but I think a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the DeFi type apps and um, and, and the action, action around digital assets is quite visible and people can kind of see this. They can be threatened by it. They can poo-poo it. They can, you know... Um, um, you know, uh, be negative about it, but it's there. But yeah. it's other apps that are happening in, say, the construction industry. Yeah. That are, people don't know that much about them. So I think this is a very helpful contribution. I want to make this uh, particular project uh, sticking in the public domain in the Creative Commons pretty soon. By the way, um, anybody who's interested, blockchainresearchinstitute.org and uh, we now have uh, dozens and dozens of these research projects that we've released uh, to the public. And please go there and uh, have a look. Um, the other thing before we wrap up, Alex, is uh, I'd like to mention we have decided, uh, due to public demand, to extend the application period for the Enterprise Blockchain Awards. Um, these are really the industry awards um, around blockchain and business and government. And uh, in 2019, um, for those who weren't there, we held this big fancy black tie event. Imogen Heap uh, performed at it. Um, it was a gorgeous uh, dinner, lots of great wine and uh, presenters and I put together a band called the Beatcoins. You can't make that up, <laughs> Google it and you'll, uh, you'll see us singing the blockchain revolution blues. But, uh, and then last year we had to go virtual. We did that through holograms and we beamed ourselves onto a stage and we actually won the uh, Biz Bash Awards for the best uh, award ceremony in, in 2020. So we're very proud of that. This year we're going back to black tie physical events and there will be great food, wine, and lots of fun. But um, your company needs to get their application in in the next two weeks. So uh, applications can be completed at blockchainrevolutionglobal.com, blockchainrevolutionglobal.com. you got two weeks. All right. Well, that seems like a good place to, to wrap things up. That's this week's edition of What's on Tap, um, and we will see everybody next week. Take care. Okay. So long.